It's a pleasure to welcome you to the fourth panel of this year's annual McLean Center Conference. Uh, this panel is entitled End of Life Care. Uh, it is my honor to introduce this panel's moderator, Dr. Susan Toll. Uh, Dr. Susan Toll is a graduate of the Oregon Health and Science University. After graduating AOA from, from Oregon Health Science University, uh, Susan completed her internal medicine residency at UC San Diego, where she also was chief resident. Later, she completed a fellowship in clinical medical ethics here at the University of Chicago. Susan founded and has directed the Oregon Health and Science University Center for Ethics in Healthcare since 1989 and has shepherded its growth into a now internationally recognized ethics center with programs such as the Portable Orders for Life-Sustaining Treatment, the POLST program, and more recently, the program in Compassionate Communication. That, that is, let, let me emphasize that POLST, which is now active in 46 states, was developed by Dr. Toll in Oregon um, many years ago. Dr. Toll is a professor of medicine and holds the Cornelia Hayes Stevens Endowed Chair in Healthcare Ethics. Her awards include the 2014 McLean Center Prize in Clinical Medical Ethics and the Oregon Health Sciences University Esther Pohl Lovejoy Leadership Alumni Award. Uh, Susan Toll also serves as the chair of the Oregon Pulse Coalition. It is a delight to introduce you to the moderator of the fourth panel, Dr. Susan Toll. It's wonderful to be here. I miss you, Mark. I'd love to give you a hug in person. I'd love to see so many dear friends in person. It's an honor to be uh, leading our panel on end of life care, our final panel for the day. Every one of our panelists is a graduate of the McLean Center though we span three different decades in our time at the McLean Center. To begin my portion of the talk, I'd like to talk with you today about the fact that we've had lots and lots of data about how POLST works, what some of the problems are, but it's really getting to be time to put that evidence even more into action. So I'll be talking about aligning post orders with wishes and what can be done to put that evidence into action. Neither I nor the Oregon Pulse program accept gifts from healthcare industry sources, so I have no disclosures to make. I have five objectives today. The first, very relevant to our title, with what is ordered on the POLST form, do you receive those treatments? Are your wishes to set limits respected? How concordant are orders and care received? The second is, what kinds of systems can we develop to assure that POLST is found and honored? POLST is a set of medical orders. The template for POLST needs to be designed and refined and innovation needs to continue to occur as there's new medical science. Next, patient wishes for treatment often change as people get sicker. POLST needs to be able to be revised and new POLST forms and orders written over time. And last and our most challenging, 
is that with success comes a little over enthusiasm and the problem of pulse being used in people who are who are too healthy for a pulse form and should have an advanced directive instead. Looking at our first objective, how well do pulsed orders match treatment wishes? The first study was done as Oregon launched the statewide use of pulsed in 1995. This is looking at eight nursing homes and prospectively looking at 150 people who had orders for DNR and comfort measures only, and finding that not a single one of them received CPR, and 5% ultimately died in the hospital. Now, some people should probably be dying in the hospital. It may not be possible to manage their comfort in their current setting of care. But this was quite different from the figures others were seeing for nursing home resident death in a hospital at the time and began the national rollout of the PULSE program. I want to emphasize that there has never been a randomized controlled study conducted about PULSE. There are lots of studies about associations and um, looking at different populations, but there has never been a randomized controlled study. There has, however, been a recent systematic review. And in this review um, by Kelly Varnas and colleagues, published in JAGS in September, a careful review of studies that were looking at treatment limits and concordance and how well wishes were respected. The study examined in the end 27,000 people and looked at the different comorbid conditions. Most of the people and most of the studies that qualified for this systematic review were from Oregon, partly because we have the tremendous advantage of a statewide registry that's been in operation for over 11 years, and because over half of people who die have a pulse form at the time of death. The conclusion of this systematic review was that there is a moderate strength of evidence that Treatment limits on PULSE may reduce the intensity of treatment among people with serious illness. That the associations we found in that early study from data in 1995 have borne up in other studies over time to show an association with both reduced in hospital death and for reduced length of stay or admission to the intensive care unit for those who have set those limits on comfort measures only for the hospitalization on limited treatment for the time in the ICU. They also identified that there are times where the system is less than perfect, and that there are difficulties at times locating pulse forms or consulting them when they're available. Oregon is extremely fortunate to have a well-established, well-coordinated statewide registry system that is integrated inside the EMS system so that EMS in the field can consult the registry making it easier to find pulse forms, but it doesn't mean everyone looks every time. Another huge advantage to being able to find pulse forms and thus honor them is that when the electronic record system tags a pulse form to the patient header with a yes, no tab, 
so that if it says yes, you know you click it, you see the form almost instantly. Um, Post is much more likely to be looked for if it's so easy to find. Another area where forms might not be found, might not be honored, is if they are scanned into the electronic record system, but it's done in a way that loads them incorrectly as date scanned instead of date signed. Therefore, not making it clear immediately which form is the most recent. There are a significant number of people who have more than one post form completed before they die. The next objective is to be sure that POLST is recognized as medical orders. And like any other medical orders, if information becomes known about what works, what doesn't, the template needs to change. We have changed Oregon's Pulse template 13 times. In those changes, we have removed sections that were less effective. At one point, there was a section on antibiotics that has been removed. And most recently in 2019, we removed the section on feeding tubes. There are new medical treatments. They need to be added to the form uh, as things have changed over the past 30 years of the use of POLST. So it's important not to put this medical form into statute or regulation because it makes it ever so much more difficult to change it. We also need to recognize that this is not one and done, that goals of care conversations need to occur as health status changes, as other events occur, or if patients now have different preferences. It is pretty common as people become more ill that they set more limits on treatment. It can go the other way, but the predominant uh, change in those forms coming into the registry uh, every month is in the direction of setting more limits as one is closer to death. Like any other medical orders, it needs to be able to be changed and to be changed quickly to avoid one set of orders, to create new ones, or in some cases, a patient decides they don't wish to have a pulse at all and to be able to avoid them. Oregon's biggest challenge is the success of our program. A little is good, a lot is better is not right for pulse. Pulse is intended for people with advanced illness and frailty. It is not intended for healthy 65-year-olds. And yet, what we began seeing after the registry went into effect and we could more accurately track patterns is that in looking at 444,000 post forms submitted to the registry over an 11-year period of time, that there was a substantial rise in the number of pulse forms completed with orders for CPR and full treatment. And in examining that, it raises questions about what encourages the overcompletion of pulse form and where do we need to be cautious about whether people are ever feeling pressured to complete a pulse form particularly when they're too healthy. One of the things we've learned in making vigorous efforts as that curve started to rise was that education is no match for incentives and that incentives don't need to be financial incentives or pay for performance incentives. 
They can just be counting or designing ways to make it too easy to complete a pulse form when something else would have been more appropriate for the patient. We have learned that any kind of counting is a problem for an advanced care planning metric. I am concerned that the new HEDA standards that encourage an advanced care planning metric, including encouraging an advanced care planning metric for anyone over age 81, may result in a spike in pulsed forms at age 81, whether or not the patient is pulsed appropriate. If someone reaches the age of 81 and they're male, pre-COVID, the lifespan was eight years more. If a female reaches the age of 81, the average lifespan is nine years. Many, perhaps most, 81-year-olds are actually not post appropriate Will we short circuit goals of care conversations if there is any kind of encouragement or pressure to count pulse forms as a metric, since it may be faster and easier to complete than an advanced directive or a longer documented conversation in the patient's medical record? We have found that a Medicare wellness annual visit template that includes a drop down to pulsed as one of the options, drives pulsed completion at age 65 and an increase in CPR uh, orders in that patient population who were too healthy to have a pulsed form. We've also found that facility discharge orders, uh, if they have a drop down to pulsed, encourage the overuse of pulsed in people who are going for short-term rehab, a hip or knee replacement, and two weeks to a facility should not result in a full code, full treatment pulse form that lives on that was not a substantial goals of care conversation and simply being used as a code status form. And I I'm happy to share that we have built not only a new and much improved POST website to make education much more available and to share all of the quality and um, details of why each change was made in the POST form, but we have also developed a new platform for the Oregon POST registry. And that platform allows much more detailed data every single month to go to each of the major submitters, the larger health systems, that look at things like what are their rates of CPR compared to the statewide average? What are their rates of what we call non-registry ready? Means there's something wrong with the post form such that it can't be entered into the registry. The date signed isn't there or can't be read kind of problem. And for those health systems that have converted to ePOLST, um, what percent of their forms are paper versus ePOLST? This is a very helpful to continuous quality improvement and we've seen major improvements in health systems who can get access to this kind of data. Still submitted to the registry, 70% of the forms are paper and about 30% rising a little bit every month are e-pulsed. So we still have a hybrid system of paper and electronic and everything is entered such that it can come back in this way to individual uh, submitters. I welcome your questions. They should go in the chat function. Uh, they won't be asked now, and we'll take a look at what that looks like uh, and welcome questions for our final panel. 
in the chat function. It is now my pleasure to introduce our next panelist. And one of the graduates of the McLean Center. He is well known for his innovation and that is too humbly stated in this bio. He was a fellow of the McLean Center and a graduate in 2008. Dr. Giuliano Testa is well known to this audience. He has presented previously at McLean conferences. He's a graduate of the University of Padova Medical School in Italy. He completed general surgery residencies both at the University of Padova and at the University of Chicago, and then a fellowship in abdominal organ transplant at Baylor Medical Center in Dallas, Texas. In 1998, Dr. Testa moved to Germany to the University of Assen, where he contributed to the start of adult to adult living donor liver transplant program. In 2001, he was recruited with the title of Associate Professor of Surgery and Director of the Liver Transplant Program at the University of Illinois at Chicago. And in 2005, he moved to the University of Chicago as Director of Liver Transplant and Hepatobiliary Surgery and rose to the rank of Professor of Surgery. Dr. Testa was recruited by Baylor University Medical Center in 2011 to lead the Living Donor Liver Program. And in 2017, he was promoted to the chief, division chief and in 2019, chairman of the Simmons Transplant Institute. Welcome, Dr. Testa. Thank you for the kind introduction and uh, thank you to uh, all the organizer of this wonderful conference, specifically to Mark Siegler. Uh, I noticed that after many opportunities I have to present at this conference, I kind of graduated out of the uh, surgical ethics into a, a much broader uh, audience. I don't know what marks I'm gonna get. For my presentation today, I'm well known for getting in trouble with my presentation. This is no difference and no different than probably a little bit uh, of uh, high brows, kind of high rising uh, uh, presentation. But anyhow, I'm going to talk about uh, the ethics of organ procurement um, from DCD donors and why DCD is one of the questions. And then we will discuss about the definition of that uh, somehow tied to this uh, topic and choosing that that I think is very important. Um, why DCD? DCD is a, a method of uh, obtaining organs for transplantation that is uh, rising tremendously. Uh, as you can see from these slides, the number of programs in the United States utilizing DCD donors is increasing uh, significantly, specifically in the past uh, probably 10 years. And only in my uh, program, uh, the number of DCD kidneys transplanted every year is rising to uh, more than 60 this year. And this is uh, our organ bank in Texas, uh, the Southwest Transplant Alliance. Uh, practically two out of 10 or three out of 10 of the donors we do are DCD donors. So it's, a, it's really a, a, a very uh, important source of organs for patients in need of transplantation. Uh, the, the, the fact of the matter is also that uh, the yield that we have with these organs is not as efficient as uh, one would imagine due to the fact that if the donor does not expire within the allotted time, uh, the organs uh, don't get procured and uh, the donor is brought back to the room to, uh, to finally expire. Uh, this didn't seem to be a big issue in the beginning. Uh, so in 2000, the National Academies Press said that um, seems that not to be a big concern how we would declare or we would intend that in these donors. Uh, reality is that uh, not too long after, 
we start to have a, a lot of voices raising concern about the way the DC donor is performing in the United States. And uh, specifically regarding the fact that are these donors really dead? Uh, there is a conflict of interest with the physicians that are involved in the donation process and uh, the concept of pre-mortal intervention, which has become uh, much important, uh, specifically this year when the uh, Association of uh, the College of Physicians in the United States um, put a very strong article out uh, condemning or uh, raising criticism regarding the normal perfusion uh, uh, of of the uh, DCDs, uh, which practically involves uh, intervention on the uh, on the donor uh, after the, do the the heart has stopped. So, um, at the base of this, uh, clearly, the dead donor rule that was uh, thought about many many years ago, decades ago, uh, says that the donor has to be dead before we can procure the organ. In the case of DCD, donor after cardiac death, the death is, uh, the, the meaning of death in this case, the definition is uh, that the heart has stopped uh, beating. Um, but uh, clearly that's only the, uh, the definition because in reality there are many problems that start when the, the, the heart stops beating. Uh, it needs to be irreversible. And uh, there is a question of whether even if the heart has stopped beating, is the brain also dead? Is there still brain function? Is still uh, brain cells are alive or not? Um, you could even see this under two different kind of death. On one side, we came to some form of more or less accepted by the great majority of people of brain death concept as the neurology defined that. But then there is this uh, uh, death after cardiosecortic arrest. And the question is, are these donors really dead? Uh, well, not yet. The heart uh, cannot re auto resuscitate, and uh, the brain must also be dead. Uh, so, in conclusion, you should have some time after the heart stops before you can declare the death of the individual. And this time has been varying between 120 seconds to up to 10 minutes. And uh, there shouldn't be any intervention to restart the heart after the darkest, uh, the heart has stopped working. But this is exactly what we're doing today with the new techniques for uh, the city donors. Um, and the, the late Robert Beach uh, saw this really, really well in 2003, uh, when he probably uh, had uh, something very critical to say about the way that the donor rule was brought to uh, our attention. Uh, but beside this, what I think it's important about what he said in 2003 is the fact that when the donor rule was, uh, was brought to our attention, it was really at the, at the down of the, of the era of transplantation, where transplantation was almost uh, still experimental. Uh, today, we can't speak of transplantation in those terms. Today, transplantation is uh, almost a commodity which is accessible to hundreds of thousands of patients uh, in the United States and in the world. So if we look at the that donor rule was created for ethical and moral reasons, mainly uh, the, the, there, is, there are many papers where they use the, 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 the verb killing. Uh, I really never really enjoy it. I'm a transplant surgeon for many years. So I never thought I, I was going to kill any donor. Uh, but what has changed also is the, the, the death uh, is not an event, a single event has become almost a, a process and, um, and there are behaviors that we establish uh, once the, the death is pronounced, and one of those is the organ procurement. Um, I, I like to see this in terms of uh, when, when to think about that is the loss of integration between our somatic function, our brain functions. And um, I think that's a very important uh, uh, concept for defining the death. Um, but I also want to bring about a little bit of a donor-centric view. Um, everything that I've read uh, about the dead donor rule and about the definition of that uh, is extremely intelligently uh, written and, uh, and mostly right, according to your opinions about that. But really, there is very little about the uh, autonomy of the donor and, and the consent form for the donor. And also, there is a lot that is spoken about the donor being used as a means to an end, which 
uh, I really never thought about in, in this. Uh, otherwise, I probably not would be not even a transplant surgeon. Uh, but in general, um, we can see the donor as a, as a person in full moral standing uh, the moment that he has given consent uh, for donation. And then in general, we can think that what is the pivotal moment uh, that uh, will start this person from being a person for whom we are withdrawing support to a person that becomes a donor. And so when do we kind of uh, intend this process of that having its pivotal moment? It's probably the moment we extubate uh, the donor or, or the patient. So none of us in this room, uh, I assume, we think that uh, withdrawing care from a patient who doesn't want to live any longer because of a variety of reasons uh, is an act of maleficence. Uh, I think it's quite the opposite, uh, sincerely said. Um, and yet we would never have thought that the physician who's helping this uh, uh, patient to, uh, to really to end uh, the, 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 the suffering is committing some moral, uh, ethical or, or legal crime. Um, uh, the, even uh, in, in the book that uh, uh, Lenny Ross and Robert Wieser wrote about defining death, there is, a, there is a, a, an interesting point about trying to define the moment in which somebody is considered uh, death uh, and in which we can start to uh, initiate those that are defined as death behaviors. Um, and I think that in my opinion, pull, the moment we decide we're going to withdraw care, the moment we pull that too, is the moment in which we can start thinking about a, a new phase in the life of that donor, uh, of that patient, and, and, and seeing him as a, as a donor for whom we have two aims. One is providing the best possible uh, transition, and two, the one of uh, uh, fulfilling the wishes that are the one of becoming a donor. And in doing this, we also are able to provide comfort and beneficence to 100,000 patients that they are waiting for those organs. Um, so if the ethical driver to withdrawing support is to respect the decision and the will of the, of the patient, then I would say that we, maybe we can apply the same ethical uh, framework uh, for, for donation itself. And we can see how we can join the desire of the donor to the need of the recipient. Um, clearly, this is this is not in not in bad. I, at least not looking at this under um, uh, one of, by the way, of the, of the very well known speaker of this conference. Uh, when we say that any time that we withdraw care, we should provide adequate pain control. We should avoid prolonging the uh, the death process. And we, we should really achieve a sense of, give the patient uh, the, the, the sense of control over their own death, which I think is a very important point. All of this you can see under a donor point of view, whereby the only way that we know that we give absolute control of pain is anesthesia, general anesthesia. Uh, the, um, the prolonging of death happens all the time in DCDs because the DCD is ex the donor of the cardiac death donor is extubated and then we had to wait until uh, he or she dies while extubated. And, uh, and by not giving them the possibility of donation, we're not really giving them a sense of control over their own death. So in, what, what I said, it, it can be seen under the patient uh, for whom we were drawing support. But I dare to say that we can also uh, make this goal of care seen for the patient for whom we have withdrawn support as the goal of care for any patient who also wants to be a donor. So we could join this in a continuum of care between the dying uh, and the fulfilling their wishes and the recipient so that they can receive the best care possible um, uh, with a transplant. Um, so this is not only what the donors want, uh, this is also what the family say. And there, there is a, a very interesting article on American Journal of Transplantation where the comments and the feelings of the relatives of the donor who do not aspire and are brought back to their uh, room uh, to finally die, uh, those feelings are seen as, as a waste, as a, an increased painful process. Uh, prolonged agony, and also they bring about this confusion about the death process itself. And uh, 
we know regarding what we we been heard we heard many times even at this conference that we can define the moral death and, and, and the, but there is no really moral death without biological death and biological that biological death is uh, is something that we can somehow quant uh, specify um when the the integration the function and the functional integration between the so the, the, the body and the mind uh, is uh, uh, is is really uh, uh, completed that that is uh, is, is not probably an easy question to, to answer because there are so many opinions about that. Uh, again, uh, Beach and Ross in, in their book say that you can define a whole brain that, you can define a hybrid brain that, you can have a somatic that, but there, there may be many, many different ways. And many people have many different opinions about how they want to define their own that based on religious ideas, based on society uh, or the, 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 the the part of they belong to based to whatever credo they have. Um, uh, but the, the, what they, they suggest, and I fully agree with that, is that uh, there is going to be a wise way of looking at this and giving a definition, which is like the central definition of, of that, as it would be a whole brain that, and then leave um, some form of a room outside the definition whereby uh, we can fit some other feelings or opinions or ideas about that, being this uh, somatic that given by the arrest of the heart or being the higher branch uh, function of, of the brain. Um, at the same time, we probably should, in 2021, uh, start considering what the wishes of the patients are and how we can uh, create a system whereby these wishes can be really fulfilled uh, based on the values of these patients and based on their uh, willingness to become uh, donors and trying to provide a gift which is as good as uh, it should be. Because the reality is, because of the way that the donor of the cardiac back uh, death is, uh, is performed, very often uh, those organs are not as good um, as they could be. Uh, and that is good to the uh, ischemia time, uh, and uh, there is a, a greater incidence of the leg graft function. So there, there is a, a chain of events that starts uh, uh, because we're procuring organs in, in following these rules that unfortunately is not bringing about the best outcomes for the recipient and kind of breaks that continuum of care that I, I would like to enhance uh, by uh, joining the wishes of the donor to the need of the recipient and making sure that those wishes are fulfilled in the best way possible. Um, so the, the dead donor rule is in a certain way um, an important uh, obstacle, I would call it. We can, we can decide, if we say, if we think that we cannot change it, then we have to rethink the entire DCD uh, procurement. Because clearly some of the comments and criticisms that have been raised regarding DCD have foundation. Uh, so if we decide that that's the way, then we have to live with it. And we have to live with the idea that we are uh, um, not procuring as many organs as we could. And we are giving organs that are not as good as they could be uh, because we stand by that rule. On the other hand, if we want to think that there is a different way, a different framework that we can apply to the dead donor rule, then we may start probably to recognize that the dead donor rule had a, a great meaning and still has a meaning in uh, when it was created, but should be revisited uh, regarding what the true patient wishes are when the specific patient decides to be a donor. Um, so my conclusion are fairly simple at the end of the day, uh, meaning that um, DCD donation is extremely important for this country. Um, it's probably the best and readily available source of organs for transplantation. As uh, move from uh, kidney transplantation to liver transplantation, pancreas transplantation, and now to heart and lungs. But in a certain way, is not utilized for the benefit of the hundreds of thousand patients waiting for a transplant because we are anchored in a center way to a framework which was extremely important when it was created, 
but should be revisited today uh, about 50 years later. Um, I would say that a renewed ethical approach would be extremely important and beneficial. It should be a donor-centric approach, and it should be founded on a continuum of care from donor uh, to recipient. And so um, that is really, I think, a, a, will be a, a beginning of a conversation. I'm not uh, having a, an incredible idea how to put this in, in practice, but I will be very, very uh, interested in participating in any conversation that allow us to see uh, donation of the cardiac diet under a different ethical light than it is today. Uh, thank you for listening to me and I'm looking forward to the conversation that we're gonna have afterwards. Thank you, Mark, again. Dr. Testa, thank you for that fabulous presentation. Some questions are being entered in the chat box and we welcome more. Our third panelist is one of the earliest fellows uh, in the McLean Fellowship Program. And each year, I and many of you look forward to David Schiedemeyer bringing back a real human element to the presentations, often with music and story. He's a palliative care doctor in Oshkosh. He provides specialized medical care to those living with serious illness. He focuses on relief of symptoms. He received his medical degree from the Medical College of Wisconsin and has been in practice for a couple of decades. It's wonderful to see you. I wish it were in person, David. I look forward to your remarks. Thank you so much. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, and it's great to be back. Uh, at, in Chicago, at least in my mind. Um, it's been my fate of late to, to watch my loved ones die of brain diseases. My son died of a, a glioblastoma in 2017. My daughter-in-law died of a grade three glioma in 2019. And as I write this, my father is in the dying process from Lewy body dementia. So I must turn my focus in clinical ethics to the issue of personal moral history, of, of moral footsteps, if you will. As a serious brain disease evolves, a person loses decision-making by degree. Often it's in an infinitesimal. My father now writes in his calendar in the wrong week. A month ago, it was just the wrong day. My pharmacist's son went from putting his own temozolomide in his daily pill container to not remembering if he took his, took his dex an hour ago. My brilliant daughter-in-law made ever smaller, ever lower point value words in Scrabble. In palliative care and clinical ethics, we rely on surrogates to use substituted judgment as a standard. I tried to use that concept that a power of attorney for healthcare should try to imagine that, for example, grandpa would be able to hear and understand everything we're saying about his disease, his medical indications, and he would be able to reason and express his preferences. This really is grid one and grid two of the Siegler decision-making system. And this grid is, of course, reasonable and, in fact, admirable. But to do this, and this is the problem, I would ask the granddaughter, knowing your grandfather 
and the things he likes and doesn't like, his interaction with the medical system, what would he do if he could magically wake up and hear all of this right now, be with us? You know, I'm, I was looking for a patient preference. But I see now that this is the wrong question. I should have been asking the granddaughter to trace his footsteps to arrive at the answer. His footsteps show his preference. He can't magically wake up and decide anything. I, I should be asking her to look back over his long life, the weaving trail of his footsteps with this family, in his faith, through his work. I should ask how he navigated the medical system. I should find out if his journey includes the willingness to fight through uncertainty and pain or if it's at its end. I should be asking how to let him die in his footsteps. The question is of course relevant in all persons with critical illness, but it's even more relevant perhaps in people with brain diseases. If someone is dying of dementia, what baseline states are we asking them to magically wake up to? Last year at this time? Five years ago, 10 years ago? Dylan, that is Bob Dylan, as we would expect from a reluctant Nobel laureate, he has it all right here. All of these issues examined brilliantly in just one quiet little song from 1962, 1963. The song, because of its dark themes, took on a special resonance during COVID-19. And during some of the worst hours of that, uh, of, of this that we're going through. And some Dylan fans think that this is really an anthem for our times. Dylan's next lines are, there's been rumors of war, and wars that have been, the meaning of life has been lost in the wind. And some people thinking that the end is close by. Instead of learning to live, they're learning to die. If we were to individualize this at the bedside, we now think of the loss of hope for each individual patient. Each person who's been informed of their brain tumor, of their Lewy body dementia, of their metastatic sarcoma, of their pancreatic cancer. The meaning of life, all that has been, all that has been known, all that has been done is uh, lost in the wind. The end is close by. Or is it? Instead of Learning to live, it is tempting, even seemingly necessary, for all of us to learn how to die. But Dylan rejects this fixation on death and dying. He begins his song with this chorus of hope. He's asking us to sing with him somehow. If given a terminal prognosis, someone tells me that death's coming round, as he puts it, he will not carry himself down to die. This line, carry down to die, is especially interesting to me because there's something about death that implies going to ground. The ancient mounded barrows, the stony tombs of the pharaohs, the, even the frozen bodies of the sparrows, all on the ground, all under all gone, all dead, death is coming round. But Dylan seeks to drown out these medieval modal chants of death. He sings, he's staying almost completely on the, on the one chord. He says, he sings, I don't know if I'm smart, but I think I can see when someone is pulling the wool over me. And if this war comes and death's all around, let me die on this land for I die underground. Now, I'm not trying to tell you how a, a song means or, or how a poem means, but it seems to me that Dylan is saying that the constant talk of despair is somehow an attempt to pull the wool over his eyes, causing his vision to be blurred, to lose focus, 
to make a wrong decision in the direction of complete hopelessness. Even if the war does come and death is all around, he still wants to die above ground, on the land, not below it. He does not want, in a sense, to be buried alive. He wants to be allowed to die naturally. Now, I would like to digress here about doctors who mispronounce death. Mirrors meant to show the steam of living breath from down in the deep coffin. Bells with strings connected to the cold fingers in the caskets. Pacemakers which just keep on pacing. The time I was learning to play the violin in an old, and I was playing in an old cemetery near the folk festival, and I saw the ground move as the supposedly dead people underground moved away from the sound of my scratchings on the fiddle, etc. But I, I won't digress. I will stay focused. What I'm saying here is that I worry that surrogate decision makers are not doing what Dylan wants done for himself and what I think should be the standard for all healthcare powers of attorney. We should be letting people die in their footsteps. This is actually their patient preference in the Siegler decision-making system. And, and I would submit that we're not doing this. Our job, our only job as surrogates is to let people die in their footsteps. Let me repeat that. All surrogates who are representing people who are adults and have a moral history, adults you know, who are not born disabled, who have a track record, all surrogates who represent them must trace back to their footsteps and make sure they're honoring where those footsteps were heading. In a sense, you need to follow the pulse the post trail. Read all the handwritten text on that power of attorney. If possible, better yet, know what is the right thing to do based on prior moral knowledge. And I like this better than the magical thinking exercise of having grandpa wake up and get all this information and be able to reason, to know everything, be part of the family meeting. Some of this seems like it might be more obvious to families than it really is. I'm not saying it's easy. One of my favorite lines when I made ICU rounds as a palliative care doc was, I don't, I don't think grandpa here in bed 12, I don't think he really wants to be on the ventilator today. Why is this grandpa on the ventilator today? And then the intensivist was sheepish. He'd come up and, and, and be sheepish and say, he's actually not just a grandpa. He's a great grandpa. So I, I now say poppycock to my, clumsy, to my clumsy attempt at finding substituted judgment in my imagination. Poppycock. What was I thinking? And what's the use of having a surrogate? if they don't trace your footsteps back and figure out how you would want to die in your footsteps. Why is great grandpa even on the ventilator today? I don't think he wants this. Do you really? Now Dylan goes on to sing of water, flowers, highways, geographic locations and peace as he often does. I will spare you all of this. But he does end the song with saying that if we go back and find the joy of life, we will be able to die in our footsteps. It's the granddaughter's job to go back and remember grandpa before he was on the ventilator or being considered for the ventilator, before he was in the hospital, before he had Lewy body dementia to remember what gave him joy, to remember what direction he was headed all his life. The times when she saw him walking and moving and talking at family parties, at holidays, at birthdays, at funerals. What would he want given his footsteps? 
then do that. Brain diseases especially teach us that we can't ask surrogates to play imaginary games. My son lost the ability to get out of bed and sit next to us at a family meeting and magically represent his wishes many months before he died. But there were still so many decisions to be made. But his footsteps could be traced clearly. His path was clear and his spirit was strong in life. May we remember that for most people, at least for most of our adult patients, there's a history of walking down the highway, as Dylan puts it. There are previous footsteps. People make their own trail as best they can. And it is our daily job, surrogates, clinical ethicists, palliative care physicians, all clinicians everywhere, to find that trail, to find that path and to follow those footsteps. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Schiedemeyer. I always feel deeper in myself when I hear your reflective thinking. And I think how often we may have worded inappropriately our guidance to families. Our next speaker on our panel graduated from the McLean Fellowship Program in 2020. Dr. Christos Lazaridis is a neurointensivist who specializes in advanced monitoring of severe traumatic brain injury. Dr. Lazaridis also is it heavily involved in neuro critical care ethics. He is trained in both neurologic and general critical care. He has co-authored over 70 peer-reviewed publications, and he has the courage to take on the title today, Death by Neurologic Criteria, a Construct in Search of Public Justification. Uh, thank you, Dr. Toll, for uh, this very kind uh, introduction, and thank you to the organizers of the McLean uh, Center for this conference. Um, so, uh, I uh, so I'm going to talk about the the title of my uh, talk. Maybe is a little bit presumptuous, but and I'm and I'm not a philosopher, so this attempt may be uh, uh, ill conceived, uh, but I'll, I'll give it a try. So, uh, just since we are towards the um, end of the day here, um, my slide, I don't see it advancing. Yeah. So I want in one slide to summarize my approach, my commitments and, and, and claims. Uh, so the, the, uh, the main premise of the talk is that defining death is really a political issue. Uh, there are plausible standards, uh, and those are uh, a somatic standard accompanied by circulatory criteria, death by circulatory criteria, death by neurologic criteria, or whole brain or brainstem death, and then finally higher brain death. Now, the approach I will follow is based on the philosophy of John Rawls. Uh, and so, uh, since Rawlsian burdens of judgment apply, which is a state of art, uh, within Rawlsian Rol thought, uh, reasonable disagreement can be expected in terms of these uh, standards. Such disagreements ought not be resolved via the coercive powers of the state. Uh, nevertheless, the state must legislate, which leads to a neutralist dilemma. 
Now, the first implication here is that citizens should be allowed choice among plausible death definitions. Now, in order to establish a default that is necessary for public uh, health, really, reasons, uh, and other important reasons that I'm going to talk about, uh, we need to exit this dilemma, and I'm going to offer a precautionary argument for that. And then finally, I'm going to argue that death by neurologic criteria is the normatively preferred default. And I employ uh, the Rolgian heuristic of or the original position or the veil of ignorance to attempt to offer public reasons in favor of DNC. Okay, so what is that we try to define here? And I like a lot this statement by Alexander Capron, who said that at issue is not a biological understanding of cells and organ systems, but rather a social formulation of humanhood. Through a formal declaration of the points at which life begins and ends, society determines who is a full human being with rights and responsibilities. The way I understand this is that no conceptualization of human death can claim universal validity, since this is a question that cannot be settled solely on biologic scientific grounds. Rather, it's a matter of normative preference, it's socially constructed, and it's historically contingent. That means that the, this situates the discussion of the definition of death in, in, in politics. It's a political matter. The question is, how should a liberal state uh, legislate death. A couple of principles. One is legitimacy uh, in imposing coercive rules stems from citizens being able to see reasons from their own perspectives to accept these rules. Defining death is necessary for medical purposes, for example, knowing when physicians are allowed to discontinue artificial support or remove organs, or when a human body may be autopsied or buried. But the definition of death and determination of death is important for other reasons. For example, investigating murder or manslaughter, when someone may be held accountable for wrongful death, when the posthumous disposal of uh, property may take place, and when to change a surviving spouse's status to, to, to widowed. Now, these are decisions that will be supported and enforced by the state's coercive power, and in their Olgian sense, should fall under questions of basic justice. Let's go to um, uh, a classic traditional way of analyzing the definition and the determination of death, a fourfold conceptual scheme by Capron and Cass. One, we need to define and agree on a death concept. And here we are talking about the philosophical definition of death. For example, the soul leaving the body or the end of personhood or the end or cessation of homeostasis of the organism. Two is general physiologic standards. These are the empirical signs that satisfy the death concept. Three is operational criteria. So what are the empirical signs that now satisfy the general physiologic standards? And then finally, we have clinical testing based on clinical guidelines. Now, the current state of the law, the Uniform Determination of Death Act, the UDDA, says the following, that an individual has sustained either the irreversible cessation of circulatory and respiratory functions or irreversible cessation of all functions of the entire brain including the brainstem is dead. Let's apply the UDDA, let's apply the fourfold analysis to the UDDA. What is the death concept? It is loss of biologic organismal integration. What are the physiological standards? It's either the irreversible cessation of circulation uh, and respiration or all functions of the entire brain including the stem. What are the operational criteria? Asystole or coma plus brainstem reflexia and apnea. And what are the tests? These are clinical guidelines for determination of DNC and DCC accordingly. So the question I want to pose is why should we accept the UDDA's commitments? May we reasonably disagree in the Rolgian sense? And what does reasonable disagreement entail in terms of definitional choice? So I would claim that there is very reasonable disagreement in terms of the death concept. So the loss of biologic organismal integration only gets purchased if we assume that we human beings are organisms or animals, an ontological position known as animalism, which is a perfectly reasonable position. However, it's not the only reasonable position. In fact, I would refer you to Eric Olson's book about personal ontology where he lists seven or eight plausible, philosophically plausible views 
about our uh, about human ontology. Now, even if we talk about general physiological standards and we endorse a biologic organismal death concept, then the appropriate physiological standard there should be the irreversible cessation of circulation and respiration. I'm sorry, the, the, the current standard is the irreversible cessation of circulation and respiration or all functions of the entire brain according to the UDDA. However, there is reasonable disagreement that this is an appropriate physiologic standard. The actual physiological standard should be the irreversible cessation of the integrated functioning of the organism as a whole, such that the organism no longer has the capacity to restore homeostasis and thereby resist entropy. And I think, I'm not saying that the, the, the current standard is right or wrong. All I'm saying is that one can reasonably disagree with the idea that, for example, the whole brain is required uh, or equals loss of, of organismal integration. And the same, actually, the same critique can be applied to circulatory criteria. What are the implications of reasonable disagreement? One is that the state ought to refrain from imposing DNC, DCC, or even higher brain death, and instead allow citizens to choose or set a default and allow opt-out. Another implication is that the law as it currently stands, the UDDA, is unjustifiably coercing some citizens, i.e. Uh, not justified by their own lights. So here comes a precautionary argument that goes as follows. Premise one, there is reasonable disagreement about whether a neurologic or a somatic standard, and by neurologic I mean either DNC or higher brain, uh, or a somatic standard should be employed as the default um, definition. Premise two, we should adhere to precautionary principle and acquiesce in the proposition that a neurologic or a somatic standard is valid in defining human. And by valid, I mean metaphysically valid. Ergo, whenever we argue in favor of one standard or the other, or a death concept or the other, we should assume that these standards may respectively not be metaphys metaphysically valid for human death. We are not thereby committed to accepting that such assumptions are true. Now, uh, in other words, what this argument does is basically says that we do not need to affirm any given conception or standard as true, only as the most reasonable uh, available in light of our commitment to certain public political values. This is sufficient to show why we ought to endorse the standard in question. Implication, it might be possible to justify or prioritize DNC or DCC, but only if one offers weighty reasons in favor without invoking validity or truth. For that purpose, in the last part of the talk, I want to employ one method to do that, and this is the veil of ignorance, famous, uh, made famous by John Rawls. Now, the original position is designed to be an impartial point of view. The parties are deprived of all knowledge of their personal characteristics and their conceptions of the good. They do know of certain fundamental inter interests they all have, plus all kinds of general facts about persons and societies. And then finally, they are also aware that of the circumstances of justice, the fact that there is moderate scarcity and limited altruism. The, their interests are defined in terms of primary social goods. But I also want to introduce another salient primary, primary good, uh, not specifically thought from, uh, uh, from Rawls, that we have to consider bodily and mental health and integrity as necessary prerequisites to pursue any conception of the good. So what the veil of ignorance does in the original position does is to put us in a place where we have to apply principles of decision theory. Now, one rule of choice, Rawls's favorite, is maximin, the idea that uh, we have to choose thinking about alternatives and choose the alternative whose worst outcome leaves us better off than the worst, uh, outcomes, uh, worst outcome of other alternatives. Now, another option is Bayesian decision theory or expected utility theory, where one has to take into account the degree of uncertainty uh, and factor it in into one's utility function, which is a preference ranking of outcomes, uh, and uh, combine that with probability estimates of the, of the various alternatives. 
Now, remember that from uh, the first implication that I started with, that, that there should be choice or opt out, um, the only rational strategy left here is maximizing expected utility. And without belaboring the point, uh, we have to think about scarce resources, and this is transplatable uh, organs, ICU beds, and other resources. That leads to a, cr a clear decision here. The fact that death by neurologic criteria has an advantage in that sense makes it the normatively preferred default. So let me take stock of what I've talked about. So we started with three standards and corresponding criteria, somatic and DCC whole brain or brainstem, uh, death by neurologic or DNC, and then higher brain, which I've not talked about. And maybe if anyone is interested in the questions, I can say why I do not think that is, it may be a plausible standard, but it doesn't generate stable criteria, at least in the current state of knowledge. Then we considered the neutralist dilemma that gave us choice or opt out as the first implication. Uh, I offered, uh, then we entered the original position with a goal to argue for a preferred normative default. The goal was to aim for a fair procedure and to simulate decision-making under uncertainty. After having secured opt-out, the only rational strategy, the, rational, the most rational strategy to follow is to maximize expected utility. I argue that these considerations in conjunction provide us with most reason to choose death by knowledge criteria as the default definition. And to complete my project in one slide, I examine this choice by subjecting it to the test of public reason. Now, public reason refers to later roles. Uh, and he argues that public reason must be able to welcome a family of liberal conceptions of justice, the essential normative conditions of a liberal conception being that, one, it specifies certain basic rights, liberties, and opportunities. Number two, assigns a special priority to these elements of a constitutional regime. And three, aims to provide citizens with the means to make effective use of their freedoms. So the two claims I've made in this talk, the first one was that choice or opt-out uh, should be allowed, uh, is in accordance or follows from the essential liberal conditions one and two. And then finally, favoring DNC or death by neurologic criteria as the default, uh, appeal to the requirement of agents for an adequate share of primary goods, specifically the good of human health, to effectively pursue their purposes, whatever they may be. And so favoring DNC follows essential condition three as it aims to provide citizens with the means to make effective use of their freedoms. I even finished three minutes earlier, so I hope, at least in that sense, there would be there will be no complaints. Thank you very much. I do think we may have set a new standard. Uh, at the end of the first day, I do not believe the McLean conference has ever ended early or been ahead of schedule. Our final panelist today. Before our question and answer, and we continue to welcome your questions in the chat function, is Dr. Dan Mitzich. He completed his fellowship at the McLean Center in 2020. He is an assistant professor of medicine at the University of Chicago. He's a gastroenterologist with a specialty interest in the management of inflammatory bowel disease and intestinal failure. As a member of the nutrition support team at the University of Chicago, Dr. Mitchick participates and helps direct the care of patients requiring artificial nutrition support, both enteral and parenteral. His interest in the field of nutrition support includes identification of malnutrition and nutrition education. He notes that the largest growing population of individuals utilizing parental nutrition on a national and international level are patients with active cancer and the outcomes related to the use of parental nutrition in this population 
are not well defined. Today, Dan will present on the topic of parenteral nutrition in the setting of malignant bowel obstruction and present data from the University of Chicago. Thank you, Dr. Toll. And let me see if my slides come up here. Perfect. And we'll start with the introduction. So good afternoon or good evening at this point of the day. And uh, I'm going to try to stay on time so we don't go over on the first day of this uh, ethics symposium. But my name is Dan Michic, and I'm an assistant professor of medicine here in the section of gastroenterology, hepatology, and nutrition at the University of Chicago. I'd like to thank Dr. Siegler for the invita invitation to present here at the 33rd Annual McLean Fellows Conference. It is an honor for me to present at this conference on a topic that came early to me in my academic career, more out of necessity than out of an actually, out of a true clinical interest. However, it really highlights for me the most important aspects of clinical care in an academic setting, and that is that we are able to formulate questions and ultimately create solutions from the patients that we're seeing on a daily basis. The topic that we are going to discuss today, parental nutrition use in the setting of an advanced cancer, I had little exposure to four years ago when I joined the faculty. While I came into the faculty with a strong grasp on parental nutrition use and the gastrointestinal disorders requiring parental nutrition, or PN as we would say for short, I had little exposure to its use previously in the setting of cancer. However, coming to a world-class cancer center such as the one that we have here, it should have not have been much of a surprise that managing parental nutrition in the setting of cancer would become a routine part of my practice. Now, as an outline for the talk, I always like to start with a strong grasp on the history of a subject. Sometimes I think it's actually important to look back into the history of a subject before we go and see what we're going to do in the future. Once we lay the historical groundwork and show various examples of how PN might be used in cancer, I will then introduce you to a common clinical scenario. And that's something that we encounter on a weekly basis, a malignant bowel obstruction. Although there is no gold standard criterion for the selection of patients in whom parental nutrition is most appropriate in the setting of cancer, I'll finish the talk today discussing our approach here at the University of Chicago and some preliminary data that we have collected, and ultimately questions that we'll continue to propose in the future. Now, the de development of parental nutrition really was a series of advancements dating back several hundred years. However, it was really since the early 1900s that we saw the greatest series of advancements that ultimately led to the development of parental nutrition. First, there was the use of sugar solutions administered intravenously and the diuretics that were required to allow the individuals to handle large volume loads. Administering proteins intravenously came about next, and interestingly, it was here at the University of Chicago that we had some of the first clinical uses of protein solutions. In 1946, Dr. Brunswick from the Department of Surgery published on the use of intravenous solutions of gelatin, which was prepared from pig skin and autoclave and used as a blood substitute in over 100 trauma patients with shock. In the middle section in the mid-1960s, Dr. Stanley Dudrick, a young surgeon at the University of Pennsylvania, put together the series of advancements and published on the first use of parental nutrition in an animal model and subsequently in six adults with a range of gastrointestinal conditions precluding oral nutrition support. The greatest achievement was then made with the use of parental nutrition in an infant born with small bowel atresia, who was ultimately kept alive in the hospital for over 200 days. Now, this was described in the mid-1960s, and it only took one year after the initial publication of parental nutrition that we have the first use of parental nutrition for cancer in the home setting. Dr. Dudrick and colleagues in 1968 encountered a 36-year-old female coming from a city 120 miles north of Philadelphia with metastatic ovarian cancer. The hospital apparatus was set up for the patient and her family to administer PN in the home setting where she was ultimately able to survive for six months. Now this naturally led to the question on the use of parental nutrition as a concurrent therapy with chemotherapy for the management of cancer. Understanding the morbidity of malnutrition in this population, several studies started to come out as early as the 1970s, describing the use of parental nutrition in the hospital setting in conjunction with chemotherapy. First, at the University of Pennsylvania, Schwartz and colleagues described 12 patients with widely metastatic disease that were otherwise considered to have risk factors for poor outcome with standard chemotherapy. 
These patients were treated with the ther therapies at the time, 5-FU and cyclophosphamide, and parenteral nutrition. And among the 12 patients, seven had a weight increase, two had a measurable reduction in their tumor size, and all patients had an improvement in oral intake and pain. Five years later, Dr. Federico Bogetti at the University of Milan described essentially a small randomized study on the use of low-calorie solutions, which were basically sugar infusions of 500 calories, or hyperalimentation, where the patient was receiving 40 to 50 calories per kilogram of body weight, something that we would think in excess of calories today. In this small randomized study, the majority of individuals, given the high-calorie parental supplementation, gained weight or had an improvement in their albumin stores. And this leads to the third box, which for me is ultimately the, the gold standard in the study of nutrition support, which is when you can make a case for enteral or parenteral nutrition, demonstrating improvements in heart outcomes. And this came to us from the University of Minnesota in 1987, where an RCT was performed, providing parenteral nutrition or basic hydration for one week prior to and over the duration of a stem cell transplantation. PN recipients demonstrated overall improvements in survival and disease-free survival. Now, since the 1970s and 1980s, the fields of nutrition support and oncology have gone in somewhat opposite directions. With respect to oncology, treatments have become more directed, safer, more effective, less toxic. And with respect to the delivery of parental nutrition, there have not been as many groundbreaking changes. We have fewer catheter-related bloodstream infections today and less toxicity from the therapy, primarily due to the use of lower calorie solutions and safer lipid emulsions. But given the overall uh, different trajectories, it probably should have been envisioned that parenteral nutrition was not going to be a standard part of chemotherapy regimens for long. A number of studies were published in the intervening years, and by 2001, a landmark meta-analysis was published by the American Gastroenterological Association, including over, um, over 4,000 patients in 82 randomized controlled trials, showing a net increase in infectious complications with parenteral nutrition in the setting of cancer. This was really a nail in the coffin for the use of PN. Given advances in the management of cancer patients, parental nutrition was no longer a novel therapy, and clear improvements in outcomes were hard to come by. If anything, if you ask most physicians or surgeons in practice today, they would quote the most common outcome of the study, which is that parental nutrition leads to infections and is dangerous. Now, I had to change the title of this slide after talking to my mentor here, Dr. Carol Semrad, who, rem who remarked to me that the use of parental nutrition in the setting of cancer over the last several years reminds her of her time in training in the 1980s, when parental nutrition was commonly used in the setting of cancer. We're reverting to more common use of parental nutrition. Despite the lack of strong data supporting the use of parental nutrition in the setting of cancer, the incredible improvements in cancer therapies has led us to a resurgence in the use of PN in an attempt to save the most ill and dying patients. As a gastroenterologist, I like to revert to at least one clinical example, and for me, it comes from a phase two study of an immunotherapy for patients that have already failed two lines of chemotherapy for gastric cancer. It does not take much experience in medicine to know that this, in, this carries an incredibly poor prognosis. From the immunotherapy study, in this case, it was pembrolizumab, 11 patients had an objective response rate. Most would argue that that is not great, 1 in 10. But among the responders, the average time of response was 8 months. Adding 8 additional months of survival, all but in a small subset, is really extraordinary and something that most patients would desire. Now, this leads us to a little crossroads again, which is when is it safe and appropriate to administer parental nutrition with chemotherapy? I don't have an exact answer, and by the end of this talk, I'll try to provide the basic outline that we're using here. However, I think there are two main pathways to get to this answer. The first is through the improved collection of clinical data, the meta-analysis on, on parental nutrition came to us from 2001 and clearly updated literature is needed on this topic as the cancer therapies improve. And secondly, we need to improve the training in nutrition support. Rather than hide it under the pharmacists and dietitians in the hospital or home care agencies in the outpatient setting, we need to broaden exposure to nutrition support in medicine, surgery, and the various subspecialties of training in order to familiarize physicians with its use, complications, management, 
and ultimately to improve the discussions surrounding the use of parental nutrition with patients. Now, let's enter the second part of the talk and describe a more common clinical scenario. In general, I'm going to avoid the topic of parental nutrition as an adjunct to chemotherapy as there is little data supporting its use and no data showing that patients can improve their functional status on parental nutrition in order to tolerate chemotherapy. Probably a more common clinical scenario is the development of a malignant bowel obstruction. This is something that occurs in 3 to 15% of all cancers. Most often, most often those, those cancers that have metastatic spread within the abdomen. Most commonly, it will occur in ovarian, colorectal, or appendiceal cancers. And the miliary spread of disease throughout the abdomen causes essentially a lack of flow through the intestines, vomiting, weight loss, and an complete inability to tolerate oral intake. The pattern of spread is such that it also limits the possibility of a simple surgical resection or diversion. In this setting, parental nutrition use has been described and is in general associated with a survival ranging from 5 to 20 weeks. Limited data is available on overall patient experiences or the complications of therapy, and a single study from Europe suggests at least a maintenance of the patient's quality of life. Now, how can we determine which patients should be considered for PN use in the setting of a malignant bowel obstruction? This can be a difficult challenge. Nutrition support at the end of life is, is fraught with symbolic and, and emotional feelings that may not necessarily be applicable to other forms of medical therapies. Families may believe that the nutrition and hydration enhances the effectiveness of medical therapy, which in this case would be the chemotherapy, and makes the patient feel better physically and mentally. For patients, nutrition is equated with survival, and a transition from an artificial means of nutrition support to an artificial means of nutrition support is a transition in their care strategy from a curative intent to a failure of the standard medical therapies. As physicians, we then have a significant influence on both patients and their families regarding the role of artificial nutrition at the end of life. It's been previously shown that physicians who do not participate in the care of terminally ill and dying patients are actually more likely to consider artificial hydration or artificial nutrition necessary. And we frequently encounter this among trainees in the hospital. When a technique or support is recommended or started, it's difficult to turn back. Therefore, improving the knowledge of nutrition support to other disciplines in medicine will allow us to improve our conversations and recommendations to patients. So what do we have done here at the University of Chicago? Well, largely led by one of our surgical oncologists, Dr. Kieran Taraga, we've gathered the various stakeholders in this discussion to include our nutrition support team, oncologists, surgical oncologists, dietitians, support staff, and palliative care, and have created a patient management pathway in order to streamline the patient care in the hospital. Now, I'm not saying that this is a solution to all of our problems in these cases, but at least it's brought together the major stakeholders in order to increase communication amongst ourselves and ultimately to help guide the patients in their decision-making process. Together, we help put out a, a consensus statement broadly on the management of perineal surface malignancies. And here we shared the latest research in order to guide the most appropriate therapies. And naturally, we discussed the management of a malignant bowel obstruction and the use of parental nutrition. Largely supported by studies from Europe, we broadly defined the appropriate use of PN to include individuals with an expected survival of two to three months. And this comes to us from data from individuals undergoing hunger strikes where the expected duration of survival, based on the expected duration of survival without adequate calorie intake. We also focused on the favorable metrics of survival to include performance status and availability of standard chemotherapies and relative metrics such as age and ability to perform parental nutrition in the home setting. As part of the analysis of this program, we've collected historical data that we will use to compare over time and found what would be expected, what would be expected which was a median survival of 142 days, a 30-day survival of 58%, 90-day survival of 38%, and a 188-day survival of 23%. In this highly selected population, finding an individual predictor of survival was rather hard, and the only factor that seemed to portend improved survival was appendiceal cancer. The most striking feature – 
However, the study was the complications of the therapy, and ultimately I hope that this will help us understand the patient experience better. On average, patients experience two readmissions and 29 days spent in the hospital, which may not sound like a lot, but when you factor that into 140-day overall survival, this is one-fifth of their remaining time alive. And from the bottom table, you can see the complications are rather serious to include catheter-related bloodstream infections and, and additional episodes of sepsis, most often from intra-abdominal sources of infection. And do next slide. There we go. We hope to continue our data collection over the coming years and ultimately try to paint this patient experience in a little more detail from an understanding of the patient's quality of life, ultimately to um, improve both our care coordination and the discussions with patients. Us understanding the use of parental nutrition, both from a medical standpoint and from the patient standpoint, will allow us to increase our ability to perform shared decision making. Now, for our last slide, by no means am I trying to make this problem sound like it has a simple solution. Each case is incredibly unique and complex, and I could give a number of patient examples that extend outside of the bounds of the simple rules that we just provided today. What this process has taught me is that predicting death is incredibly difficult, and in the setting of a malignant bowel obstruction, predicting complications can be just as fraught with error. Ultimately, engaging with the patient earlier in the disease course and getting to know the patient before the initiation of parenteral nutrition for me, comes with the best outcomes. And in closing today, I really just want to leave you with two minor points, two little minor points that are at the bottom of the slide. And these are two references on two great articles that were published in the New England Journal of Medicine. One from our moderator, Dr. Toll, now several years back, on who should have the discussion about end-of-life decision-making with the patient. And for me, it's really the person that has the most familiarity with the patient, even if it's just at that time. That can be the gastroenterologist, the oncologist, the family care provider. What probably matters most is that the physician be there for the patient when they need them most and have a relationship with the patient. And lastly would be a piece that I just came across published in the New England Journal last week from a primary care physician in Boston on a patient of hers that was just diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And she discusses the increased specialization and fragmentation of medicine. What caught my eye in the piece was actually a quote from an economist here at the University of Chicago, Dr. Kevin Murphy who was talking about the division of labor. And in that quote, it says, the specialization and division of labor depends on the coordination costs. The fragmentation of care, particularly at the end of life, is driving up our coordination costs. Hopefully through processes such as the ones that we are introducing here at the University of Chicago, we can reduce these coordination costs and ultimately improve on the patient experience. And with that, I hope I was able to stay on time and I'll turn it back to Dr. Toll. Thank you. I'd like to bring our panel together and uh, have some interesting questions in the chat box. And welcome everyone. The question that uh, received the most votes, I'm going to ask Dr. Schiedemeyer to help me with. That question is, some hospital lawyers don't allow polls to be honored if the surrogate disagrees with it, even if the patient wishes are clear to the physician. How can we overcome this? This sounds like a call for footsteps, and I thought maybe you would take a swing at this, Dr. Schiedemeyer. Thanks. Oh, that's a, it, it just seems to really follow what we were talking about, which is um, if, if you know what your person would have wanted, uh, it should keep you awake at night to not honor that. So we have, I mean, uh, and I, I would actually, I was fairly strong when I, back when I was practicing to say to patients, families who are not honoring their wishes, um, it, it really says right here, in this power of attorney, in this pulse, if you will, it says right here, they don't want this. How do we square that with what we're doing? Um, I, I just think it's, uh, 
uh, I, I think it's a uh, really we need a new. Sometimes I would say maybe we need it, the secondary power of attorney to take over if you can't honor the wishes. And I, once or twice I was able to get that. So I do think uh, you know they're not doing their job if they're not uh, tracing those footsteps. That's just uh, you know they're doing the wrong thing, maybe for the right reasons. So I think it's our job to just insist that they uh, stay on target. Now, so what would the what would this? As Mark always says, you know, in court, I'm not sure if I'd be the last one standing. They would. You know, you see who's the last one that stands uh, after the, all the arguments. But uh, what I mean, what's the use of having a power of attorney if, uh, if you can't have it honored? What's what's the point? What's the it, so very tough, though, isn't it? What what are your thoughts? Well, fortunately, this is infrequent. Um Sometimes there is a preliminary just panic and then further conversation and it's really out of shock or struggle getting bearings. That's a very different situation than the, than the person who stays committed to a different path. The level of angst of the healthcare professionals is off the scale in these situations. It is extremely high in the level of moral distress. Um, when there is documentation, there's every reason to deeply believe that the individual's values are indeed correctly reflected in documentation and often perhaps conversations that further validate what's on a page. Um, those situations are fairly rare and I agree with you that in some of them, we're able to, to say, look what's here. Let's talk about why this seems so different from what you're saying. And literally, I love your language. Let's follow the footsteps of the person together and see why what you're saying is different what's here. More often than not, that fixes the problem. But usually when the lawyers get involved, it's that very small number that can't seem to find the footsteps and that are um, not necessarily acting in behalf of the person that they're appointed to represent, but instead charting their own path in a very different set of footsteps. Um, I want to be sure, though, that we realize why we have empowered surrogates so much. Because so often there are changes in orders near the end of life. They reflect changes in health status. And we do not want to lock on to something, never to be able to change it as health conditions change and perhaps the person wishes to set more limits. The trade-off is that we have a couple of cases a year, two or three, where we're at loggerheads with the surrogates that we have therefore empowered as the price we pay for being able to continue to make changes near the end of life. Once in a great while, that may need to go to court, the surrogate may need to be replaced but in general, um, those numbers are actually quite small when we spend the time to help the patients and families get on the bus with us. Thank you. Um, there's a question from Dr. D'Angelo's to Dr. Testa. Does it count as a graduation requirement to be moved out of the surgical ethics panel. Uh, I suspect I, there's not, a bit of mischief behind that. 
I'm, I'm not sure. I just noticed it happened to us. It was the first time that I was not in the surgical ethics. But as everybody knows, I'm, I'm a, in this crowd, at least I'm a transplant surgeon. and I like to raise issues that I have to do uh, with my daily life. And uh, the, 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 the teaching I got at the, at the McLean was very clear about uh, the fact that uh, you don't take things at face value, but you try to understand them. And I'm not saying that the way I understand those things is the, the right way or the correct way or the only way, but at least I was taught to, to uh, investigate. Thank you. The next question is for Dr. Uh, Lazaridis, and it is, how do you test for loss of higher brain function? I can see myself donating my cerebral, once my cerebral hemispheres aren't engaged, but before my brainstem is gone. Yeah, thank thank you for this uh, question. I'm glad someone asked. I'm not sure I have. It's not. I don't think it's an easy. I don't think it's an easy question. But all I'm gonna say about higher brain death is that the I think the greatest problem is is not con the problem is not conceptual. The problem is uh, empirical and epistemological. So. Uh, to talk about higher the higher breath definition, it should be based. So the, the physiological standard should be the irreversible loss uh, for the capacity of consciousness. And at this stage of knowledge and at this stage of techno technology, the the ability to de to detect that, to be certain that the capacity for consciousness has been irreversibly lost, uh, is very much in peril. In fact, uh, what used to be known as the vegetative state, which, for example, would be exactly that, patients who have lost uh, cortical function, but they have preserved brainstem function, and they have been considered as irreversibly unconscious, it turns out that a lot of these patients, maybe 10 or 15% of patients who appear behavioral, behaviorably, uh, I mean, from behavioral criteria to be in a vegetative state, they do have covert consciousness. So if you do functional MRI or you do advanced neurophysiology, you will detect uh, uh, preserved, at various degrees, preserved consciousness, also known as functionally locked in. So the problem, I guess, so the, the, the problem is not, uh, just to repeat, not conceptual, as it's, it's potentially a plausible standard. However, I don't think that we have the means to um, apply rigorous criteria that can identify that state, the irreversible loss of the capacity for consciousness. And so the risk is that there is a great uh, uh, potential for mistake. And so I do not think that this standard can generate stable criteria. And if someone wants to go with higher brain, I think the safest uh, place to draw the line is death by neurologic criteria in their current form. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is for Dr. Mitzic. It's uh, hospice patients. There's a significant uh, variety of whether uh, total parenteral nutrition can be continued by a hospice agency. What do you think about total parenteral nutrition in hospice patients? I mean, it's completely variable. Um, and even here, we've tried to kind of get a sense as to which hospices potentially offer it and which hospices don't. Personally, I have some difficulty with the administration of parenteral nutrition in the setting of a hospice because at the same time, you're at times using very high concentrations of potassium and infusing it directly into the bloodstream by a central catheter. Uh, performing parental nutrition without without monitoring can be difficult. Now, at the same time, we have stable parental nutrition patients uh, that get annual labs. That's how stable that they are. Um, and now that we've seen some of the, we have patients that have been on parental nutrition since the 80s, uh, early 90s, they are reaching other conditions and potentially even dying from those. So it's something I've gone back and forth with. I, I, I don't know that I have... Uh, uh, an incredibly strong feeling on uh, or, or an incredibly correct solution as to which way it should go. 
but what's really never been compared, particularly at the end of life, is going to be high calorie versus low calorie uh, solutions. I'm giving something, I think, even if, even if it contains some dextrose or primarily the electrolytes, I, I think is definitely reasonable. And so, so at a minimum, we at least try to continue with hydration in, in, in patients that cannot continue parental nutrition in the setting of hospice. Doing uh, everything without monitoring, I think, can be difficult, but there are ways of minimizing what we put into, into the parental nutrition to make it look more like hydration. The next question is for Dr. Lazaridis, and it's, is fetal growth possible if the mother is dead by any criteria? Uh, yes, but de by death by neurologic criteria. And, and there are reported cases in the literature where uh, a pregnant uh, woman has been declared dead by neurologic criteria and pregnancy has been supported and continued with the goal of delivering the baby. So the answer is yes. And, and potentially I would, would venture to say that um, obviously you could support a pregnant patient with ECMO and sustain the circulation without native circulatory function and respiratory function and have the same outcome. Thank you. There's a question about POLST and the challenge of the healthy 65-year-old and how uh, different states are addressing that issue. Uh, and the it basically the overuse of POLST or the incentives or, for example, having a requirement uh, to have a POLST form to be in a particular facility, those kinds of challenges. Uh, I'll dive into this question after I recruit support from Dr. Schiedemeyer to ask if he uh, has seen any problems in Wisconsin with the overuse of POLST in people who are too healthy. Um, Susan, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I don't know where we are uh, with POLST now, um, and I will plead some ignorance from being retired. So I don't know the answer to that, but I, I do appreciate as a hopefully somewhat healthy 60 some year old, 66, that if, uh, if there were incentives for me or for my doctor to uh, complete a pulse, it would be, I, I do think I would have different feelings now than in 10 years. So I, I think it's a valid really valid issue of the healthy 60-ish person. Um, yeah. I don't know when, it seems to me, at least in, in patients when I've seen that people really do start to go downhill in their 80s um, and the physiologic reserve is just, you know, if they, they just go downhill whether they think they do or not. So, uh, <laughs> I, I, you know, I don't, uh, so I don't know the answer to that, but I would say uh, the clock is ticking after you're 65. After you're 65, the clock is ticking. <laughs> well, I think another way to flip the question is to say, what good does it do to have a pulse form when the only thing on it is full code, full treatment? And there are no other categories on the Oregon Pulse form. So if you mark full code, full treatment, you get care that's any different than you would have gotten with no Pulse form at all. And are we in some ways short circuiting a conversation that might need to happen over time in greater depth? So that would be my biggest concern about completing Pulse forms early on for full code, full treatment in people who are on the healthier side and not engaging in deeper conversations. I don't, I fail to see how this will benefit them in uh, any kind of change in their care and may cause some challenges uh, if their health status were to change. And now we have a full code, full treatment pulse form. If they haven't had in-depth conversations with families 
we have seen a certain amount of anguish looking at this full code, full treatment pulse form. The person has now had a massive stroke, for example. The situation has changed and, um, and there is a heavy load to be carried by families if there has not been a lot of advanced care planning about contingencies, if a surrogate has not been legally appointed. We have seen times where it appeared to increase the burden on surrogates. So another, and we're getting close to the end of our time. Uh, a question. Nope, not that one. There have been several questions about muddying the line between life and death. A donor close to death is not dead, but could be an unwelcome new frontier in ethics. Perhaps a comment about that, uh, Dr. Lazaridis. Um, I, I think Dr. Testa should, <laughs> should go first. I think his talk was closer <laughs> to that. And, and I'm too scared, I'm too scared to answer first. <laughs> Dr. Testa, please take this one on. Yeah, I, I'm not sure why, why it's, it should be unwelcome. I, I really don't understand that concept. I, yeah. I, I refuse that concept, actually, because it goes against most of the things that you have been discussing about, about respecting wishes. And I think we should reframe the entire... If you ask me, uh, my wife knows that if tonight going home, I'm going to be hit by a car and I'm going to be in a status where I can be a, a donor after cardiac death, I want to be brought to the operating room. I want to be put under anesthesia. I want to donate my organs so much that they will be as good as possible to whomever is going to receive my organs. And I'm not the only one who thinks like that. So I refuse that yeah, this is unwelcome. I will open a conversation about should be unwelcome and why we shouldn't do something that now is good for hundreds of thousands of patients. Thank you. Well, we are at the end of our time. We've had a very vigorous panel. I've appreciated all of the presentations today. And 